Okay, good morning once again. We have been talking about spiritual things, specifically a spiritual battle, as well as hinting at spiritual gifts. This is the next verse in our series about what God would not have us be ignorant of. Uh, if you'd like to continue following along, you can open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll go over the passage that's in question still. And maybe after this week, we'll talk about the actual spiritual gifts, such as the word of wisdom and knowledge and so forth. So, on your way to 1 Corinthians 12, let's open in a word of prayer. Our Lord in heaven, thank you again for the privilege and honor it is to get together here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your saints around the world whose hearts are seeking after you, desiring to make a difference, to know you better, to study your word, to stand upon the truth of your word, not compromising, but sharing that truth and love to those around them. There are so many members of this body we will probably never meet this side of heaven, but we're so thankful, Lord, for that blessed hope that one day we'll separate, celebrate paradise with them, with you, forever. I am thankful for those things that uh, you give us in the here and now. As there are many things that um, are difficult for us to understand, difficult for us to go through. But it's such a joy and blessing to know that we have the victory in Christ Jesus, that we have a salvation, a sure hope that cannot be taken away. Lord, we have that place waiting for us by your side. It's hard to even fathom that, that the, the God of all things loved us so much that you want us right there in your person, within your person, that we can celebrate life with you forever. Thank you for taking all the sin upon your shoulders shedding your blood to pay for all of our sin through Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask, as always, fill us with your wisdom as we study about spiritual things. We would not be ignorant either. Uh, so, Father, as we talk about these things, open up our hearts and minds that we may hear and learn the things you would have for us this morning. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. I'll just keep going here yet. And there are diver differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. These foundational verses help us to understand about spiritual things. Now, I know it specifically talks about gifts here in this passage. I brought up at our first Sunday, our first message time, concerning 1 Corinthians 12, 1, that the term gifts there is not in the original. It literally does say, now concerning spiritual things, or perhaps concerning spirits, I would not have you ignorant. Okay, so there's things about the spiritual realm or world, if you will, that we ought to know and understand. God wants us to know these things. As we study through Scripture, we get snapshots uh, here and there, uh, especially of how Jesus himself, or God himself rather, personally intervened in the world. We have personal encounters of Jesus with men, right? We could say like the burning bush that Moses encountered, the Shekinah glory of God, perhaps you've heard of that term. Or when Joshua met the man, and he asked, are you for us or for your enemies? And he says, I am the captain of the Lord of the hosts, right? So there's many times in scripture where you see God personally intervening. And if not him, then it's one of his angels, like Gabriel. 
All right, so we have these glimpses into the spiritual reality that's there. Uh, I'm already digressing, but I can't help but mention Colossians chapter 1, where God says that he created all things both visible and invisible. We can't see with these physical eyes the spiritual world, but it's still there. All right, and that's the reality we need to understand and uh, come to know that we should not be ignorant of certain things. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we talked about verse 2, where the Gentiles were carried away unto dumb idols. They cannot speak. We went over a couple of passages, like in Jeremiah 2 and 3, where uh, the Israelites would chase after and seek answers from things like this. Right? It's like, why would you ask a table to help you out? Or why would you ask this thing? But it's not different than if they were to carve this into a figurine and then ask it for help or thank it for life, right? Which is what they were doing in Jeremiah 2 and 3. Thank you for creating me. Like, that's not what they did. You cut a piece off of that and made your dinner with it, right? God tells them that. Even in that passage, it just calls them out, and yet somehow they're blind to the reality. Well, God does not want us ignorant of spiritual things. So we talked about that, about idols, and how the important things is to remember, as Gentiles, they were worshiping something other than the one true God, right? In time past, how often can we bring up Ephesians 2, 11, and 12? Remember, at one point, you that were the, are the, we're called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, right? That you were separate from the commonwealth of Israel. You're without hope, without God in the world. It was bad news for the Gentile. But God, right? So here's what God did for us, is that he came into this world through Jesus Christ. And he went to the cross willingly, shed his perfect, innocent blood to pay for the entire sin of all the world. That now we Gentiles who once were separate from Israel are now brought nigh or brought near to him by the, by the cross. He is our peace. He took Israel and Gentile and made both one in the body of Christ. That's the good news we preach today. It's so awesome because we don't have to go through Israel. We don't have to go through a priesthood. We don't have to do any sacrifices or anything. God just says, you simply trust what I did for you and you're in. Right? This is excellent, amazing news, which I'm glad I'm seeing you all smile about this. This is our gospel that we preach today. However, we still should not be ignorant of spiritual things. Now, the Corinthian church, they are saints. They were saints. Right? They had written a letter to the Apostle Paul, and he's going along and answering all these questions, starting back, I think, in chapter 7. But even before that, uh, <laughs> arguably going all the way back to chapter 1, when he says, now, you know, to the saints in Corinth and to all saints abroad, or however it's phrased there, within just a few verses he says, I hear you guys are divided. Come on. <laughs> right, you can only, only sense the uh, parental disappointment in the behavior. But they are still in Christ, so I don't want to lose focus on that. They had a lot of correction, and dare I say, we've got a lot of correction in the body today that ought to happen. Uh, in a passage that I'll probably explore next week, not this week, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we've got job security of sharing the truth in love, right, to help us all come to the spiritual maturity in Christ. It's a big paraphrase of Ephesians 4, but uh, we, we ought to keep busy. Now, I, I wanted, I've talked a lot about the actual gifts themselves and how they are abused today. I made mention of this in the last couple of weeks. I'm going to say it probably fairly often still today and for the foreseeable future, how it is not the sign that is the focus, it's the message. God gave Israel all these signs, why? Uh, to prove his message, that he was with them, right? Because going back to Moses and the burning bush, I just talked about that already. Uh, Moses is talking with God there, okay? And God tells him, you go take this people up out of Egypt. And then Moses says something like, well, who am I going to tell? Uh, sent me. And God says, I am who I am, or that term Jehovah or Yahweh, however it's really pronounced. But that's the, the name that God gives him. And Moses still, like any human, what if they don't believe me? You know, he's not quite sure yet to go back and, and do what God told him to do. Uh, and then God gives him two signs, right? 
he says, put, or throw your staff on the ground. He throws it on the ground, it becomes a snake. He picks it up and it becomes a staff again. And likewise with his hand into his clothing, it comes out leprous, he puts it in and out again, now it's healed. Okay, so he gives them signs, why? To prove that God was with Moses. Okay, that's the point. Moses went with the message, hey Israel, we're getting out of here. And why would they believe him? You know, you can imagine they've been oppressed by Egypt for so long, like, what? Yeah, right. Like, really, check this out. And you can imagine him doing these signs, and then it's like, whoa, God is with you. Let's do this thing. Right? <laughs> really using today, today's vernacular about that, but I think you get the point. So the signs were to prove the message. We looked at a few different encounters of false prophets then. Because we've talked about these signs aren't the things to be trusted, it's the message. And if God is going to use signs to prove his truth, Satan then, being his adversary, is going to use signs to deceive, right? And we see that throughout Scripture. We went back to Deuteronomy 13, I believe it was, where God says a prophet has to be 100% accurate. And he also says if a prophet gives you a sign and that sign comes to pass, then he says, let's go chase other gods, you don't follow him because I'm proving your own hearts to you, right? It's not the sign, it's the message. So God allowed false prophets and false signs for the purpose of proving the heart. And this is probably one of the harder things for us to comprehend. This is going back to Romans 9 through 11, but mostly chapter 9, when uh, we read verses that say God, that God said to Pharaoh, for this reason have I raised you up to show my glory to those who actually believe in me. And again, that's a paraphrase. You go back and check that out. But he... He, uh, God puts up with those vessels fitted to destruction, which is the term used in Romans 9 there, not because God created them to destroy them. God loves all of humanity. Right? Christ died for the entire world. And so it wasn't God that wanted Pharaoh to reject him and die. God says several times, and I think I showed you one or two in Ezekiel, where he says explicitly, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so many times in the prophets where he says, just turn to me and live. Right? You can see him pleading with mankind, and mankind just says, yeah, I don't want that. I'd rather have my, my uh, joy for a couple of days or weeks or months or whatever, and then go into torment. That's for me. Because that's what's going on in the world. Man has the choice. Okay? In the beginning, God created everything perfect. God said it was very good at the end of Genesis. And he gives man one rule. Man rebelled against God. Man rejected God. Man bought into the lie that man could be God. And God, it's man brought sin and death into the world. And God said, hey, I'll fix it for you. And so now the choice is still up to man. Will I trust God and accept his free gift of life and eternity in paradise? Or continue trying to be my own God? And, and <laughs> Good luck with that, exactly. <laughs> but that's the choice everybody has. Right? And that's why I constantly challenge all of us, myself included, where's my heart at? You know, do I trust God? Okay, then in this decision, what, I, what ought I to do? Right? And, and sometimes that's harder to act on because we're just in the heat of the moment. But we ought to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Not to give occasion to the lust of the flesh, but to allow the spirit to work through us that no one can have anything evil to say against us. That's Titus 2. Right, so that's how we ought to behave. Coming back now to spiritual things. So we looked at Acts chapter 8 with the false prophet of Simon. Right, here's a guy who was doing all sorts of signs and wonders and stuff, and people were, were saying, here's a great man of God, and Simon's like, yes, I am a great man. Whatever he said. He was, you know, he's puffing himself up like, I'm the best, here I am. Then Philip, one of the deacons, comes in you know, of of. Israel, the church of Israel, put it that way, believing Jews. Philip comes into Samaria where he is, Simon is, and he does all these signs and wonders and says, hey, Israel, your kingdom's coming. Repent, be baptized, let's go. And they saw all these signs by Philip and they're like, yeah, that's what we're waiting for. And so now they're all believing and Simon's like, yeah, I can believe that too. Uh, and apparently he was baptized, but his heart wasn't right yet. So he went through the motions, and though he believed the words to be true in his heart, he still rejected it. Try to logic that one out. It's kind of hard. 
But that's what the reality is because uh, John and Peter come by because they heard of all these people now in Samaria that were rejoicing in the truth because Philip was there preaching, evangelizing, if you'll allow me to use that word, good newsing. That's, that's essentially what that word means. And they come and they lay their hands on all the believers. Holy Spirit comes on them, more signs, more wonders. And then Simon's like, I want that. Here, here, I've got all this money. Let me have the Holy Spirit. I, I want to give it to people. Right? And so Peter's like, uh-uh, it's not the signs, man. The kingdom's coming. Your heart isn't right. You'd better repent and pray to God that you don't get cursed or you know, whatever he said there. And then Simon's like, whoa, 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 I don't want that. You pray that that doesn't happen. There's a one-man act play, I guess, for Acts chapter 8. But the, that is, doesn't that reflect much of what we see today in the false prophet realm? I mean, there's so many people I've encountered personally, several, that wanted to sell lesson plans on how to prophesy or how to um, speak in tongues. These aren't for sale, right? You, even in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 and verse 4, where it says, now there are diversities of gifts. You don't sell gifts, right? We don't go to the Christmas tree and auction things off, right? That's a bit silly to you, you know, just for those of that tradition to hand out gifts at that time. You don't go to a birthday party. I could say the same thing and just say, okay, happy birthday. Now, how much are you going to give me for this one? Okay, how much for this one? Should we do a silent auction this year? I mean, how silly is all of that? No, they're not for sale. They are gift. And why are there gifts for, given by the Spirit? Verse 7, to profit with all. It's for everyone to profit. I promised in the Sunday school I'd say this, so here we go. Uh, when God was establishing the body of Christ, the sign gifts were prevalent. Why? To emphasize the message given by God. All right? and we could take a little aside, and by little I mean probably three weeks, to go over Acts 9, 22, and 26 with Paul's conversion, Saul's conversion, and how Jesus sent Paul to the Gentiles. And this was a different message than what he gave to Peter. Okay? Different message, same Jesus, same God, same spirit, <laughs> right? But different message to the conclusion in uh, Galatians 2 and Acts 15 that uh, the circumcision and Paul <laughs> had the right hands of fellowship that Peter, John, and all of them would uh, stop their message. They'll restrain themselves and stick with the circumcision. And then Paul and Barnabas is named specifically, and Titus was there too. They're going to take that message to the Gentiles, the whole world. Right? And Peter's even saying something like in Acts 15 that we should be saved even as they. Right? That, that we are saved by faith through grace, apart from works. Right? And so that they're all agreeing to all of that. So now Paul is going about and establishing the body of Christ, this new creature, 2 Corinthians 5. Right? So as he's going, God is giving all these signs and wonders. Why? Because we didn't have all of this yet. Right? And so since we didn't have the full word of God, which didn't come until everything was revealed to the Apostle Paul, Colossians 1.25, we could look at this as well, but the dispensation committed unto Paul was to fill up full the word of God, to fulfill the word of God. That's what it says. So once God revealed everything to the Apostle Paul, then the body of Christ would be established and we no longer need the signs. Does that make sense? Because this is what we read through Scripture. I'm not making this up. It's, it's in here. And we'll get there. Okay? Uh, so when we see that uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, that there are differences, different gifts, different administrations, different operations, uh, but it's the same, how does it say it? Same Holy Spirit, verse 4, same Lord, like Jesus Christ, Son of God, verse 5, and same God, which worketh all in all. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are right there, giving you a trinity uh, in there. Now I compare this. So we, we have different operations, different administrations in the body of Christ to establish the body of Christ. Similarly, when God birthed Israel, he set up different administrations and operations with them, didn't he? Right? He established the priesthood. He told the other tribes, you give to the Levites. They are your priests. I am their inheritance, and what you give to them, that's their sustenance, and so forth. So God set up the nation of Israel by or through his law. At all 613, if anyone counts. That's the common number I've never actually counted. Okay? <laughs> it's a lot. We'll just put it that way. But when he established Israel, he set up the order. 
right? And so when he established the body of Christ, God set up the order in which it was going to be done. And I bring all that up because this epistle was written in the middle of the Acts period. I think I've taught, uh, told you before that Paul visited Corinth in Acts 18 when sign gifts were still here, there, and everywhere following believers and establishing the message to the body of Christ that Jesus paid it all. It's a great hymn, isn't it? Uh, so, um, where was I going with there? The, pur the purpose of the signs was to prove that message. Okay? And so when he's going to talk about here in 1 Corinthians 12, all these different kinds of, of gifts, this spiritual gifting, it wasn't uh, like the Corinthians apparently were doing, of comparing to one another, I've got a better gift than you. Or, you know, he's going to give the silliness of um, the body, the image of the body. Well, I'm not a hand. Man, now I'm not part of the body. I mean, that's what he's talking about here, giving us a picture. But you can imagine saying, Man, I just wish I could speak in tongues. <laughs> right? And don't people even do that today? Ah, if only I could prophesy. I wish I could tell your future. Which, incidentally, is not what prophesying is all about. It's telling forth the word of God. It's the being the spokesman of God. God says, thus saith the Lord. That person says, hey guys, thus saith the Lord. Right? So that's the job of the prophet is to tell forth what God said. I'm really jumping around here. We'll get there. Okay? Probably next week. I wanted to go over some other examples of uh, false prophets because this is something we still deal with in the present age, present time. And we're going to deal with, it's actually going to get worse uh, into the tribulation period where Jesus is even quoted of saying, if it be possible, even the very elect would be deceived. So it's going to be so deceptive that everyone's going to fall for it except true believers. Crazy thought to think how much worse it can get, but it can. So where are we? Acts, Acts 13. Let's turn there. Acts 13 is the first record of Saul becoming Paul and heading out with his message. So up until this time, he's been preaching and teaching in Antioch, along with several others in verse 1. Well, let's just, yeah, we'll just read verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So there's Saul of Tarsus now preaching the word of God, the gospel, the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Verse 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So here's God intervening. And verse 3, it says, When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. But to be clear, verse 4 says, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. So this was something God was doing, not just these men. Right? They departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. This is John Mark, by the way. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer. And again, this is the Greek magos, or magician, Okay, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. And for those playing the name game, uh, that would mean the son of Jehovah who saves. Okay? Uh, so then uh, verse 7. It's just really interesting, the names in this passage. That's why I point this out. Verse 7 says, Which was, of the, or was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus. So here's a Gentile a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So here's a Gentile that says, yeah, I want to hear this. I've heard about this message. I want to hear it directly from them. Some such like that. Okay, so he calls for them. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. Well, this is the Arabic name of that same false prophet, that same magician. And Elymas means wise. Okay, so I guess if we put them together, he would be called the wise son of Jehovah who saves. But he's going to get another name in just a minute. Okay. He withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. The one true faith. Jesus is the Son of God. Right? And all the details that go along with that. 
verse 9 says, Then Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Not quite the name anybody would like. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And you can go on from there, but I think that's a good place to stop. So you can imagine, hopefully, by now, the scenario. Right, where a Gentile desires to hear the word of, a God, of God, not a God, the God, and, but he had a Jew who apparently was something of his right-hand man, perhaps an advisor, hard to say, but he was right there with him to the point where this deputy was going to listen to what he had to say, but he was trying to prevent him from learning the truth. Okay? So there is, and he's called a false prophet, a sorcerer, uh, and he's withstanding the one true God. And we could talk about all the different details, the names which I think are interesting, or that this Jew is blinded for a season sure seems to line up with Romans 11, doesn't it? Or how part of Israel shall be blind until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and all Israel shall get saved out of the tribulation period. They'll all be one nation <laughs> under God, I had to say it. Uh, but they will all be one nation with their heart for God. They'll all be saved. Right? And that's not happening until the end of the tribulation period. So just some interesting things to think about in that passage. But again, the point is that there are false prophets withstanding the truth. And there are false prophets today. Last week, and I think the week before, we asked ourselves, or I asked at least, how can we tell the difference? There are signs. I don't deny signs. There are signs in this world. Supernatural stuff still goes on. How do we know it's from God? Right? That's the question we got to answer. And I've I think someone even said it here before. It's like, you line it up with the Word. We've got everything we need here, so if it does not line up with what he says, throw it out. It's not right. It's a false sign. By and large, I will say, most signs today are false. Because we don't need them since we have the full Word of God. Okay? So I, I get very skeptical when someone talks about a sign. But I still I, I can't say... 100% certain that God will never act that way. Perhaps no one has access. I don't know. We can speculate and talk about that till we're blue in the face. God can do what he wants to proclaim his message. I'm not going to put him in a box. Okay? But by and large, we don't need signs because we have his word, and all believers have his Holy Spirit, and his Holy Spirit is what discerns the truth for us. Right? That's in 1 Corinthians 2. We'll probably go through that chapter again in the near future. Let's turn to Acts 16. This is an interesting one. Acts 16, verse 16. The little bit of background. Paul is now in Philippi. And he's preaching the word of God here in Philippi. And in verse 16 of Acts 16, it says, It came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said unto the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And then they got mad and threw Paul in jail. <laughs> we won't go into that, but isn't this an interesting one? Here is a spirit of divination, which is a not Holy Spirit, right? And it's, but it's proclaiming the correct message. Isn't that fascinating? But what's amazing is, it, well, it, you know, is, is that it is a true message, but it's a false spirit. It's a lying spirit because that same spirit brings to humans money. Right? It's doing it for the money, and there's a whole bunch of lies going on there, we can imagine. And so that's why Paul was grieved. I don't want this person under the possession of an unclean spirit. So out it goes, right? So it's just interesting to point out it's the right statement, but it wasn't the spirit of God, which is what 
provoked Paul then to exercise it, uh, just like you know the signs that followed. You will cast out demons in my name, right? So that happened right there. That's really all I had to say about that one. Uh, if we want to turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. After just five short verses of praising the Lord Jesus and for the saints at Galatia, Paul was inspired of the Holy Ghost to write, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the, gospel, the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Dare I say that problem is still prevalent today. There are many false gospels going out in the world today. There are some that do pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've gone over many different examples already. Like, oh, you've trusted in Christ? That's great. Now you have to do fill in the blank. It doesn't even matter what it is. Right? It's, it's a controlling legalistic aspect, and it's not good news. Or that if they might even say, you know, you can, you can now prophesy, or you can do the tongues, you know, or I'll teach you how to use the Holy Ghost. It's, it's not, that one, that just bothers me. And you see me get all emotional about this, because it was, I've endured that. I went through it personally. Uh, but you can't teach gifts. <laughs> gifts are not something that can be trained and honed. Those are physical abilities. I guess we sort of use the word talent today. Some will argue that we shouldn't use the word talent. I don't want to get into an English lesson, so I won't. <laughs> we'll just leave it that way. But there are false prophets going through the region of Galatia and to point out that the spiritual battle is a real thing. We endure it still today, every day of our lives. And so we ought to be equipped to withstand, right, and having done all to stand. Like Ephesians 6 says, put on that full armor of God. Wield the sword of the Spirit so you can cut through all these lies. Right? Hold up that shield of faith. I trust that God is real. He gave me all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. I have a spot in heaven. I'm going to have a brand new body. I could talk about all those things, give you the exact verses because they're awesome. And I think about them all the time. Right? Because this present evil world is a real drag. Drags you down. And so I want to think on those things, those heavenly things, rather than on the earth beneath. Seek your, set your affections on the heavenly things, like it says in Colossians chapter 1. But recall, too, what uh, the Corinthians were arguing in their questions. Right? In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, they were arguing or asking about things offered unto idols. Right? And they were probably, based on what we have reading here in 1 Corinthians 10, they're probably saying something, it's just meat, and the idol's nothing. We all know this. Now, wherever they were at with, with their mentality, but it's probably something like that. At least Paul responds in that way. Uh, but the punchline being, verse 20 in 1 Corinthians 10 says, I say the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Right? You've got to think about what you're doing. You, we know, yes, we know the idol is nothing, but what you're doing is condoning idolatrous practice and you're destroying your brother. Right? You can't do that. They're doing it to devils, not to the true God, so don't go along with that. Uh, you got to stand up for the truth to the one true God. If they say it unto you, uh, I'm a, I, this was sacrificed unto, don't care, idol, don't eat it for his sake. Right? Again, that's a paraphrase of the rest of this chapter. But if someone is going along with some sort of paganistic, idolatrous practice, we can't do that in good conscience. And I don't know how many times Paul is even quoted of saying, my conscience is clear before God and men. So you know he didn't do that. And twice in the Corinthian epistles, he says, be ye followers of me. Right? So that ought to be our mentality too, is to walk in the spirit and not after the flesh. 
I feel like I say that every week, don't I? I need that reminder, though. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I need that every, every day. Okay. Spiritual battle sure is real. There is a difference, I did want to point out, though, between the gifts given to the nation of Israel in the Great Commission, which was great, still is great, uh, but also the gifts then given to the body of Christ, which is also great, right? uh, because of the audience, mainly. Uh, you turn to Matthew chapter 10. And all this, again, is to help us understand spiritual things, spiritual timeline, I suppose. Matthew chapter 10. All right, Jesus alive in his earthly ministry. Jesus ministering unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, he's ministering to Israel, for Israel, with Israel's message. Hopefully that's clear. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all in that same context. Matthew chapter 10. I won't spend a lot of time on this. In verse 1, uh, it says, When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, cast them out, heal all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. Tells us the names in verse 2, 3, and 4. Verse 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then look what happens. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. Freely have you received, freely give. What does that sound like? Hopefully gifts, right? <laughs> they didn't have the power to do this themselves, but they were given these gifts. But what happens first? Preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preach it, give the sign to prove the message, move on your way. But who are they to talk to? Only the Jews. Only the Jews. Why? Because that promise, the everlasting covenant, was made to the Jews. Okay? It's not until what the gospel revealed unto the Apostle Paul where we Gentiles, who were separate from all of that, are now brought nigh by Christ. Thank you, God. Right? Okay? So let's just make sure we understand the difference there. Oh, yes, I did. Okay, I think we already said it, but I'll say it again. The Gentiles were never given those miracles under the law. Recall how much of an astonishment it was in Acts 10 and 11 when Peter recounted what happened in Acts 10 when they went to Cornelius in his house and they spake in, I go with the old English, they spoke in tongues that blew the minds of the Jews that were with him. And they thought, whoa, salvation's come to the Gentiles? What's up with that? Right? Because up until that point, uh, Peter even says in Acts 10, you know it's unlawful for me to willingly come unto you who's not a Jew. Right? So now, what do you want? Right? So he, he, he reluctantly apparently went along to Cornelius because God told him, you go doubting nothing. <laughs> and so he went, even though he wasn't too excited about it. But what happened was God showed him a new thing. Right? He was establishing the body of Christ there. Acts is a book of transitions. I can't ignore that. It's a book of history going from Great Commission to um, the establishment of the body of Christ by the time you get to the end. It started in Acts 9. I'll give you the spoiler. Because some people say it didn't start till Acts 28. Some people say it's Acts 2. Some people say 13, 16. It's 9. Okay, that's when Saul was saved. That's when he says, I'm the pattern from now on. 1 Timothy 1. So it had to be then. Okay? <laughs> so, I'm not trying to be a little pungent about this, but that's just what my understanding is. All right, so now we get to, where am I? Luke 10, another example. Luke 10, verse 1. Very similarly, I won't spend much time here. Luke 10, 1. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So these seventy went to places Jesus would later visit. What was the message? Jump down to verse 8. It says, into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. 
And right after that it says, Unto whosoever, whatsoever city ye enter, they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, as we, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Whether you're received or not, preach it. Doesn't God say something pretty similar in 2 Timothy 4? Be instant, in season, out of season, right? Preach the word. So whether they're going to listen or not, which it seems more often not, than yes, they do, we have the greatest news mankind can ever hear, uh, this side of heaven. It's going to get better when we go there and then come back here, I guess, in the new earth, but, um, or restructured, I suppose, at that point first. I can't help it. I got eternity on the brain real bad. These last few weeks, it just, I don't know why. Very excited for the new that's coming. Okay? So Jesus was going into these towns, but he sent these 70 out two by two. Don't want to get into that either. A particular cult goes out typically two by two preaching their kingdom message, which is not true at all. Uh, it's a different Jesus and a bunch of flies in there. Um, you know what it is. So anyway, let's go to John 10. I try not to condescend. Sometimes I can't help myself but call out false prophesying, false gods, and that sort of thing. Uh, John chapter 10 and verse 24. This is one of those hysterical passages. Because if you read John 6 up to this point, you just shake your head when you read it. Uh, John 10, 24 says, Then came the Jews round about him, Jesus, and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus said, I told you. <laughs> you already did several times over by this point. That's why I just like, wow, it's hysterical. I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. See that same pattern? He told them in plain language, I'm the Christ, with the signs that they should have understood. I'm the bread of life, right? That's back a couple chapters. Like, I am all of these things, and they didn't get it. I am the good shepherd in this chapter, right? So he says, you didn't believe me, because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And my Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And then he says this, I and my Father are one. What's their reaction? You're right, you are the Christ, let's go for it. <laughs> nope, very much the opposite. They took up stones to stone him. Very clearly, Jesus is saying, I'm God, in that passage. You, I don't know how crazy of hermeneutical gym gymnastics you can twirl about in this passage. Jesus is God, and he said it very plainly, just like they asked. And again, they rejected him. Why? Because they're not true believers, and they never will be, apparently, which is really sad. But the point of coming to this passage is, without that message, what would he be doing those signs for? Right? He, just, he says, Jesus, our Lord, says that the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But without him as Christ, without the message of here's your Messiah, what's the point of all those works? You can't have one without the other, can you? So the, but the point of these signs is to establish the one true message that Jesus is the Christ, and he has come in the flesh at that time. It's a heart problem, and it has never been an evidence problem. People will hide behind that, saying, show me the evidence of God, but that's not the problem. It's a heart problem the entire way through. So if you ever find yourself in an, an encounter where someone's like trying to tell you, you proved to me God exists, we don't have to do that. Okay? God already did it, and they're rejecting him. So just share the gospel, and let's move on. <laughs> telling you from experience. I don't want to get in that debate ever again. Share the gospel and move on. That's, that's the best advice I suppose I can give. Man, where does the time go? We might have to do another week. What is the point of me going through all of this? Hey, I think I've already said it. But the point is to reveal unto us spiritual things, spiritual warfare. 
Right? We read about the spiritual battle we're engaged with. We don't war after the flesh. Our weapons are not carnal, right? Second Corinthians says that, uh, as well as Ephesians 6. Our battle is spiritual. We are against the spiritual wickedness in high places, right? We're headed up by Satan himself. And Satan is prowling about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, borrowing from Peter. Right? He's alive and well. He's doing what he's doing, but he is not omnipresent like God is. Right? And I can borrow the verse that says, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world, which, again, Satan. Right? Who's stronger than that? But even in the passage, or, God, I know I said that the wrong way. Uh, no one is stronger than God because the passage we just read said, none is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And Jesus said before that, no one can pluck them out of my hand, concluding with, I and the Father are one. Right? We have that same promise in Christ in Romans 8, don't we? If, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Both rhetorical questions. We cannot be separated from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how Romans 8 ends. So that's us in Christ Jesus. And so again, that's, that's another part of the spiritual battle too. How, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to do a poll. I almost did, asking how many... Uh, have asked you or said something about losing salvation. And I bet most of you would raise your hands. So many people have said this. That's a big lie in this world today. You read about that here and you cannot be separated. Period. Right? And it, most people go to Ephesians 1 to see about, uh, oh, I'm sealed in the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption of the purchased possession. But did you know that most epistles written by Paul says that you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Two or three times it's in 2 Corinthians. I think we saw it here in 1 Corinthians. I'd have to research that some more, so don't quote me on all of them. But it's throughout his epistles, you see that you are sealed by that Holy Spirit or that Holy Spirit which is given unto us. So some sort of terminology like that. But he's talking about it in different ways. You know, it's not just one passage. We've got several to back it up. It is biblical truth that we are sealed. But how does that mean we should act, right? Use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. There I go with that again. Oh, man. I want to go through at least these two passages, and then I think I can recap next week and move on. Okay. So Mark, Mark 16, I did want to make a point about this. I don't think I made yet. The Mark version of the Great Commission, Mark chapter 16, and as you're turning there, I will point out that a lot of people say that Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, should not be in your Bibles. That's a lie. Because they'll argue, well, it's not in the majority of texts. It's in the textus receptus, the Latin term, the received text. But it's not in the majority, so we should throw it away. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is very much in your Bibles for a reason. It was confirmed by prophets and those given spiritual gifts. There's a point and a reason to the spiritual gifts to say, what is canon? It was not determined at whatever that council was, the Nicene Council or whatever in, in 8300-ish. I don't remember the terms of all of that, but that was not the, the time when it was determined, oh, what's Bible and what's not. No, it was already determined way before that. It's a little aside. I always get very emotional about this, so I apologize if I come across as a little angry, but that's the way it's going to be. Just to warn you. Okay, so Mark 16, verses 9 to 20 definitely belong in your Bibles. It fits perfectly with the Kingdom Commission and with Israel. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Okay, I'm just focusing on verse 16 where it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay, faith plus works, you could argue, verse 16, but without faith the works do not save. That's always been the thing, the just shall live by faith. Verse 17, though, says, These signs shall follow them that believe, 100% of the time. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover, 100% of the time. Okay? People that try to do these gifts do not have a 100% success ratio. It is much less than that, if positive at all. Most of them are zero. <laughs> if we're honest with ourselves. Why? Because a change took place. God set aside the kingdom program for now and gave to the Apostle Paul the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of the uncircumcision to dispense to the world. When that's all said and done, God is going to finish up what he promised through Israel. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Okay? So it's going to happen. 
but to establish the body of Christ, there were signs and wonders to follow that to prove the message was from God. Okay? Yeah, ultimately resulting in that right hand of fellowship again from the twelve, Matthias having replaced Judas, and Paul, Barnabas, Titus, at least. I don't know how many more were with them, uh, but at least them were at the Jerusalem Council as it's become commonly known as. But these signs shall fall in that belief. Have you ever asked yourselves why do they need those signs? Let's just think on that for just a couple seconds. Why would they need things like being able to cast out devils, speak in new languages, that's what tongues means, not some gobbledygook gibberish that someone has to interpret. It's an actual established, established language. Oh boy. <laughs> language. I'll get it all out eventually. Uh, it, so it, the purpose, and we're going to read about that in 1 Corinthians 14, is for unbelievers to believe. Right? They all spoke in tongues at Pentecost because all these devout Jews from all over the world came and they heard the wonderful works of God in their own native tongue. And they're thinking, these guys must be drunk. <laughs> right? Because they're saying all these different languages, but then Peter's like, no, 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 you got that sign, here's the message. And again, the sign proves the message. And what happened at that time? Oh, they were pricked in their heart. They said, what do we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. 3,000 were believed, or were into the body of Israel, if you don't mind me phrasing it that way. Right? So the signs and the message, the signs prove the message. Why do they need these specific signs? Well, Revelation 8, I don't know if you want to turn there, but I'll just give you an idea. Remember at Mark 16, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, whatever it is in John, 20 maybe, and Acts 1, they're on the Great Commission. They're on the cusp of going into Daniel's 70th week. Okay, So that was the 70 weeks determined for Israel and Jerusalem to fill up full uh, everything. It's a paraphrase of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 if you want to check it out. I'm running out of time. That's why I'm running or speaking a little faster because I just want to finish this point so we can start on something new next week. Okay, so they were going to fill up full. They were going to need these signs to follow them that believe. God does say he would supernaturally protect at least a remnant of Israel during this tribulation period. We'll, re we'll study Revelation maybe at some point, Lord willing. Uh, Birch, where am I? Revelation 8, verse 10. It says, Third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. It fell upon a third part of the rivers, upon the fountains of waters, which would be fresh water, by the way. The name of the star is called Wormwood. Anyone got the joy of tasting Wormwood? It's very bitter. The third part of the waters became Wormwood. What's the result? Many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. What did we just read in Mark 16? Uh, you shall drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. There's a reason <laughs> for these signs, okay? And I'm, you can speculate or study on your own, I suppose, through Revelation how Israel can be supernaturally protected with those signs, and it's going to follow them that believe. How do we land the plane today? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, take a deep breath, calm down. Uh, so the spiritual battle is very real, and it would do us all a service uh, and, and profit with all, right, if we were to understand spiritual gifts, the reason for spiritual gifting, and why, by and large, we don't see them today. It explicitly says in the very next chapter of, I'm pointing at 1 Corinthians 13, uh, but it says in the very next chapter here in 1 Corinthians 13, Prophecies will cease, right? Uh, I'll even read it. Prophecies shall fail. Whoops. Prophecies shall fail. Tongues shall cease. If there's knowledge, it shall vanish away. All right, and, and all those Greek words follow along with what that says in the English. They're going away. But what remains? Faith, hope, and love. And what's the best out of those? Love or charity here in the Old English, uh, which would be that sacrificial willingness to serve one another. And what have we been talking about for most of the Corinthian epistle? Right? Their behavior was way out of line, but the answer was always the same. Love your neighbors yourself. Right? Love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. Just like Jesus says, the top two commandments, you love God, you're naturally going to love your neighbors yourself, because that's the way you ought to behave. So that's probably a good note to end on. Let's go love the world. Let's pray.
<laughs> oh, Lord in heaven, we are so thankful for your holy word, thankful for the truth of everything that we can understand this world around us in uh, whatever limited capacity we have in our humanness. But I'm thankful, Lord, for giving us the mind of Christ, your Holy Spirit that indwells us, everyone that believes, that we can spiritually discern things. Thank you, Lord, for those gifts uh, that you did give to the body of Christ, for establishing the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the life that you give in Christ. Most importantly, uh, all those spiritual blessings in Christ for those that believe. Uh, thank you for that blessed hope. And Lord, I do pray as we continue to think about spiritual things, help us to stand strong in that battle that we find ourselves in, knowing we have the victory in Christ already and that one day when that trumpet does sound that we shall all be changed. Lord, what a glorious day that will be. Uh, until then, help us to stand strong in, uh, in Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.